through the 12 sons of uh, Jacob and the blessings that came on them. And today we come to the second here, the third, because we've looked at the blessings that came upon the sons of Joseph in the previous chapter. So tonight, chapter 49, and verses 5, 6, and 7. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger, so fierce, and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. So you remember then that uh, just before Jacob died in Egypt, he sent an urgent message to all his 12 sons, leave looking after Pharaoh's cattle and your own herds and come. I'm going to make a, a blessing and pronounce a prophecy about each one of you. And so one by one they approached him and he spoke to them where in all the others sat and listened. They never hear such important words again. He spoke first to his oldest son, Reuben. You would expect the first son to receive special status, but because of his wickedness, this is forfeited. So it would pass then to the next in line. The second and third sons by his wife Leah were Simeon and Levi. But then these brothers, we discover, were also wicked men, unworthy to receive the birthright. The first thing I want to deal with then is the cruelty of their early behavior. We're told bluntly, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Verse 5, why did their father say that? What's the point of it? All the twelve are all brothers, half-brothers, true brothers. He's the father of them all. Why does he start this prophecy by saying Simeon and Levi were brothers? Well, the answer, of course, is that they weren't simply brothers in a, a biological relationship. They were also brothers in the sense that their mind and their disposition and their values and their enthusiasm were brotherly. Levi was a brother to one who destroys. Um, Proverbs 18.9 They worked together. They walked along the same unscrupulous track. They were tuned to the same evil frequency. There was not a membrane that you could put between them. Levi, just as guilty as Simeon, they were the Cray twins of the land of Goshen, an evil duo. Two mean men joined in their commitment to wickedness. Jacob's second and third sons were brothers, one in nature. And Jacob singles out their wickedness, not now the sexual sin of which their older brother Reuben was guilty of, but they were men of extreme cruelty. Their swords, verse 5, are weapons of violence. Do we have this today? You, you better believe it. Are we not sickened and hardened by accounts in the news of horrific violence? Well, in Afghanistan and in Libya and in the Sudan and Pakistan... And there are the horrors of modern warfare and the torture and the cruelty inflicted on women and children and prisoners. There's the drug trade and there is the enslaving of women and there's the cruelty inflicted on the unborn child. We live, I'm afraid, in one of the most violent and heartless generations in the history of the world. It seemed so different when these two boys were born. Their rejected and neglected mother, Leah, had thought, now my husband will be joined to me. He will be bound to me by our natural affection for our sons and our mutual child support. There will be this band holding the marriage together. So she thought... And the name she gave to her third son was Levi. And Levi comes from the word to bind. 
Now Jacob and I, she said, will be bound together. I know he loves Rachel more than me, but I've given him three sons. So she was full of hope that the sight of the three little boys running around the family home then would mean that their doting father Jacob would be calling in and dangling them from his arms and sitting them on his lap and telling them stories and a love relationship would develop between her and her husband. But it takes more than that and other things than having children together. To guarantee that a husband and a wife are going on in a relationship of love. Having children can also be used to drive people apart. Christians can experience what Leah was to experience when these things didn't work out in the way we hope. And that many a time the purposes of God are of an entirely different nature. Leah, it transpired, was a very opposite name for her third son, but not in the way that Leah thought, for Levi was bound to Simeon. He was totally under the influence of his older brother. So the time came when these brothers' swords became weapons of violence. You remember the infamous occasion? You remember that uh, the boys had a full sister, and she was a girl named Dinah and she was fancied by a man called Shechem who either seduced her or raped her and then he fell in love with her and he asked his father Hamor to get her as his wife and when Simeon and Levi heard what had happened to their kid sister they were outraged they were filled with fury at what had been done to her Hamor came and asked uh, Jacob and asked the boys then if his son could marry Dinah. And Shechem himself spoke up, offered to pay the highest bride price that they might demand. And it was then that the deceit of Simeon and Levi was evident. They told Shechem that they couldn't dream of their sister marrying an uncircumcised man. But if all the men of the town were circumcised, then it would be the beginning of cordial relations between these two large families. And there would be intermarriage then that naturally would flow from it. So Shechem leapt at the deal. What a fine line of boys has this man Jacob produced. These boys, he told the townsfolk, and he was the first to volunteer to be circumcised. He was such an influential and popular figure that all of the men of the town then just followed him. All of them were circumcised. He was such an influential, he was such a charismatic and popular figure that all the men from the oldest to the youngest opted for circumcision. It was a dare. It was a trend. It was a sign of bravery. If Beckham gets a tattoo, everybody gets a tattoo. And so they were left then weak and hurting after the operation. Then the monstrous wickedness took place. If you want to read about it, it's in Genesis chapter 34. And I'm reading from verse 25. Three days later, while all of them were still in pain... Two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and attacked the unsuspecting city, killing every male. They put Hamer and his son Shechem to the sword, and they took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. The sons of Jacob came upon the dead bodies and looted the city where their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and donkeys and everything else of theirs in the city and out in the fields. They carried off all their wealth and all their women and children, taking as plunder 
everything in the houses. There we are, Genesis 34, 25 to 29. It was just in human cruelty. It was an overreaction to a bad deal. Every man killed all the widows and fatherless girls who were taken as plunder to be slaves. It was the Holocaust of Shechem, perpetrated by Levi and Simeon, the sons of Jacob. These were Old Testament Messiahists, Old Testament anointed ones, Old Testament Christians. The great grandsons of Abram, a family of believers in the Lord who were acting in this way. Here were men who lived under a law that said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The law that said, You shall do no murder. It was male genocide, plotted by lies and deceits. There was no justification for the action, and every reason for cursing it. So now, Jacob, hurting still, years later, the horror still fresh in his memory. His boys did that. And as they come to him to receive the prophecy and the blessing, he says to Simeon and Levi, cursed be their anger, so fierce and their fury, so cruel. No blessing for them. They're not to receive an inheritance. Reuben forfeited it, and now Simeon forfeits it, and Levi forfeits it. They are not to receive the inheritance in Jacob. Levi will never have a, a parcel of land and men will say that valley in the north over there and that uh, hill in the south and the springs that spring up in the east and the river in the west, all that, all that is Levi's. No, they're going to be scattered throughout Israel. They live in every village and hamlet and city. They live in little white houses on distant hillsides. In them you will find from Dan to Beersheba members of the tribe of Levi. There's no place that they can call, this is my homeland, this is where my clan, this is where my tribe, this is where we belong. That's the curse that came upon them and their children and their children's children to the fourth and fifth generations. That's how the curse resting on them for murdering men and hamstringing oxen in their cruelty. That's how it came to expression. Avoid the brothers Simeon and Levi. Avoid them. Dodge them. Get out of their way. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Remember the stark warning that you find in Proverbs chapter 1 about being influenced by, uh, by violent young men. You have it in Proverbs 1 and verse 10 to verse 16. My son, if sinners entice you, don't give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We'll get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us. And we will share a common purse. My son, don't go along with them. Don't set foot in their paths. For their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed blood. In days of riots and looting and knife crime. Mobile phones being taken from young men and young women. Purses snatched. Should we not heed such warnings as this. Violence is like a drug. Oh, don't mix with violent young men. 
old Jacob as a father, patriarch, and yet their father. He felt the power of it, the power to be drawn by a mob. <laughs> you saw the sorts of people that have been arraigned before magistrates for being involved in, uh, in the riots, not just the underclass, but graduates, students, working people, their car boots full of plunder that they stole from shops on the, those nights of violence. He feels it, doesn't he? You see how Jacob feels it. Even as an old man, he feels it. He says, verse 6, Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger. What a wise man. Evil counsel corrupts good living. So you have this then, don't you? You have this sorry situation in the family of Jacob. Uh, Reuben, the firstborn, he's bound to get the inheritance. No, he grossly sinned against heaven and against his own father, doing things not mentioned among the Gentiles. He's lost his birthright. Well, you come now to Simeon, and surely it will be his, but he shows he's a raving psychopath. Cursed be you, my son. And then the third in line is Levi, and he's just under the shadow of his brother, fueling one another's wickednesses, the one as bad as the other, a pair of psychopaths. Cursed be you, my son. Cursed be your fierce anger. Cursed be your cruel fury. He too has forfeited his right to the birthright. We begin to wonder, well, are they going through the whole list? Where is this going to end? Who is worthy to receive it? Which of these boys has not been guilty of sins that mean he forfeits the right to receive the blessing that comes on the firstborn? Reuben is gone, Simeon is gone, Levi is gone. All stand before us as examples of gross evil. All raised in the home of the patriarch Jacob, the grandson of our father Abraham. The second thing I want you to see then is the extraordinary diversity of their scattering. The prophecy then, the judgment that comes upon these boys, verse 7, I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Now you understand Jacob here, he has, uh, has the spirit of prophecy, the, the spirit of God is on him, and he's speaking in the name of Jehovah. And when we look at the subsequent history of the lines of Simeon and Levi, we see this exactly what happened. There was no place for them in Israel. But when you look at the destiny, of how these two boys went, the different lines, the different ways in which they were scattered. It was most striking. Simeon. Simeon was scattered. When Simeon was scattered, his tribe slowly, imperceptibly, remorselessly annihilated. Four centuries later at the Exodus, they still existed. They're numbered there with Reuben and Gad. And after 40 years in the wilderness, a striking change has taken place. There's a census. And instead of almost 60,000 fighting men that they had then, they have now shrunk to 22,000. They're now the smallest tribe. Moses then mentions that they still existed in Deuteronomy 27, but when he lists the tribes of Israel in Deuteronomy 30, no mention is made of Simeon. No portion of land is allocated to them. There are few towns within the borders of Judah, and they lasted only till the reign of, of David, 1000 BC. You can't find them. There's no refuge. There's only a little cottage somewhere in a valley where there's a little family. And they are pure Simeonites. Simeon was scattered so comprehensively among Israel, not one family was left. Not a single Simeonite could stand and say, I'm 
pure bread, born and bred uh, of the tribe of Simeon. He was dispersed as effectively as the ten northern tribes were scattered to the four winds of heaven, broken up, lost forever, gone into oblivion. And this tribe is soon a name that no one bears as we could say their surname. Abram Simeon, Benjamin Simeon. There was no one like that. No clan name. It just became a given name. It's a pretty name, Simeon. We've had Simeons in our congregation. There may be a Simeon here tonight. It's a euphonic name. But it bears no relationship whatsoever to the tribe of Simeon. They're all gone. God did it. He said, I will scatter them. I will disperse them. And God did. God can break up denominations. God can break up professing churches that have lost the gospel. There are many formerly thriving groups that are now shrinking year after year and they are looking for survival only by being attached to other shrinking groups which are in the process of being scattered. The Lord Jesus speaks and warns the church in Sardis in the letters of the seven churches that he can blot out people's names. He blotted out the name of Simeon. Levi. Levi too, were scattered, but all very differently from the destruction of Simeon. There came a crisis in the life of those who were Levites. They could have gone either way. They didn't know that day that they were going to be asked who was on the Lord's side. And if they'd taken the wrong choice, then they would have ended up like Simeon. It was the time of the rebellion at Sinai. Moses was up in the mountain these 40 days receiving the law from God. And when he returned, his face was shining. There were thunders and lightnings and angels were there ministering. And he brought the tablets of stone down. When he came down, as he came down and down, he could hear something. He could hear the sound of music, the thud of drums and dancing. And when he came into the camp, he found the people were dancing around a great golden cow that his brother Aaron had asked for gold from the people. And they had, the women had taken off their earrings and they put them in a great cauldron and heated them up. And goldsmiths had come and they had cast a great golden calf. And Aaron stood before the calf and faced the multitude of the people and said, Behold your God, O Israel. And the people went wild. People who had known delivery from slavery in Egypt were being escorted by God, led by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire into the land of Canaan, flowing with milk and honey, the people who had walked through the Red Sea, the people who were being fed manna and quails, and water flowed from the rock to minister to all their needs. And here they are dancing before the golden cow and saying, thank you for being our God. Moses was shattered at the sight, and so remember he shattered in pieces the te tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments, and that stopped the music, and it stopped the dancing. And in the silence, he spoke to them, and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? And the silence was finally broken by... Simeon's brother Levi saying, here am I. Well, we can all say here am I, can't we? Communicators can work over a, an audience and music and lighting and choreography and heightened feelings can get people to say what communicators want them to say. Was this a mere profession. So what did Moses say next? He said, go through the camp and slay the idolaters. 
Here am I. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Are you in this fight? Are you involved in this holy war? Every Christian is. Every Christian battles with the world and the flesh and the devil. It's a fight. Come and join us in the fight. Here's the sword of the Spirit. It's the word of God. Use it. Use it well. Use it to advance the cause of God's kingdom. Here am I, Simeon said. A profession without any action is dead. So the Levites unsheathed their swords. Some of those swords came down from their father. Swords that had been used for the massacre of the men of Shechem. And now they went through Israel. And with Jehovah's approval, they slew mercilessly those that had turned from the living God and were dancing with joy, worshipping a cow made of gold. The righteousness of Jehovah was avenged by the swords of Levi. Here am I, he said, and he acted upon it. Levi had borne through every generation the marks of Shechem, the marks of cruelty and violence and evil. And it was time now to expunge that wickedness by showing a repentant heart and a life of new obedience to the Lord. It didn't wipe out the past. That past was still to haunt Levi and make Levi groan about the monstrous deed that would never be done again. But here was, here was the privilege, here was the opportunity to show a new heart, a spirit of radical new obedience that was here in, in his life. And so he took the sword and slew the idolaters amongst God's people. And Levi was scattered through Jacob and Israel. There was no section of the land ever given to him, no mountain high or valley low, no house, no city. But he was given the house of the Lord. That was going to be his dwelling place. That's where he would live. There would be rotors and it would be his turn each year to leave his family, to kiss his wife, go by, leave the village street and go to Jerusalem and serve in the temple in the name of the Lord. So he was scattered but he was elevated. He was given honor and glory. The curse rested upon him. No inheritance was given to him. No land that belonged to Levi. But the Lord was his inheritance. And the Lord's house was his true home. And every house in Israel and every house in Jacob. It was going to stand open to him because he was a Levite. He was a pastor. And he would go and he would speak to the children and tell the children the things of God. And all Israel was going to give him a tithe, the tenth. They were going to bring it to Levi. And that is the ironic way in which God dealt with his people. That's the way he led them. This Levi, who was the brother of Simeon, who had such a sad beginning, blossoms and grows into the glory that means he can stand. He can enter the holy place. He can serve at the altar of incense. He can prepare the bread for the table of showbread. He can keep the lamp burning. He can put fresh oil in. He can help the people who come with their sacrifices to confess their sins. And he can assure them of mercy and kindness. He can do that. What a great end for such a bad beginning. You see it in Saul of Tarsus. The torturer who becomes a teacher. The persecutor who becomes a preacher. The bigot who becomes a baptizer in the name of Jesus. Your violent past need not impose itself irresistibly upon you so that you say, thus it must be for me for the rest of my days. It need not be. 
Though sin has abounded in your life, grace, this grace can become your grace and it can much more abound than your sins. And the whole history of Levi was turned around. Even while the whole condemnation of Jacob came to pass, curse be their anger so fierce, and their fury so cruel, I will scatter them to Jacob and disperse them in Israel. That occurred, but the dispersal became like the scattering of salt. You are the salt of the earth. So you're, you're not in a, a monastery somewhere, chanting at four o'clock in the morning. You're out. The monastic walls, the nunnery's walls, have been broken down and, and you're involved you're involved in the east end and in Soho you're involved in the red light area and along the waterfront and you're involved in a secular university and you're involved in your places of work tomorrow and the days ahead God scatters us the whole history of this tribe was turned around it began in sin it ended in consecration it began with weapons of warfare and it ended with the weapons of the Christian armor. It began with a curse and it ended with a blessing. How does God do such things? If the murderers of the, all the men of Shechem, young and old, if they can become priests and Levites, if the Pharisaic torturer Saul of Tarsus can suffer to bring Christ to the nations of the world. There's room in God's kingdom for you. However bad the past has been, however ashamed you are of what you have been and what you have done, God is able to take the murderer of Shechem and use him in priestly service. He can take an SS prison guard from Auschwitz. He can take a Japanese soldier who's goading and whipping a British soldier who's building a bridge on the River Kwai, and he can change those men. He can make a serial killer like the son of Sam. He can make him a godly presence in, in prison. He can make people new creatures. He can make all things new. He can forgive all your past. He can wipe the slate clean. He can make you new, however atrocious and dirty the sin may be if you seek mercy from this great, this holy God. If you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, you become a priest to God. You will. You will. And so I stand in amazement when I read what happened to this man, Simeon. There is hope for everyone here. Thirdly, I want to say something now about the inconsistency of the lives of the sons of Levi. Not a year goes by without hearing of someone who uh, once came to church and then they got turned off when they saw the behavior and the inconsistency and the lives of professing Christians. That's the excuse, that's the word, that's the observation that they make and there's some truth in it. Levi had great privileges from now on, but Levi had great falls also. The work of holiness in his life, like the work of holiness in any of our lives, is only the beginning of a new obedience. It is not perfection. There are constant failures and constant victories too, and that's the Christian life. And so he says, when I would do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. What a wretched man I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That was the Apostle Paul, of course, at the end of Romans 7. And we know who rescued him. It was the grace of Jesus Christ. That Savior who is with us tonight. That Savior who rescues men and women 
tonight who saves to the uttermost those who come to God by him because he is the great high priest who ever lives and intercedes for us. So I want to give you some examples of the inconsistency in the followers of Levi, in Levi and his line. Because you will say, ah, well, look, Christians are so poor. And they are. And we let the Lord down, we do. Firstly, um, Korah, the son of Levi. In number 16, he showed his carnal, carnal ambitions. We're told he became insolent and he rose up against Moses, verses 1 and 2. And he told Moses he'd gone too far and he'd set himself up in the Lord's assembly. But it wasn't uh, Moses' ambition. Moses had accepted a call at a bush that burned with fire and was not consumed when he was told he was to go as God's ambassador and leader and deliver his people, God had appointed him. It was Korah's ambition. He wasn't satisfied with being a Levite. He wanted to be upgraded. He wanted to be a priest. And Moses sees him, number 16, 8 to 11. Now listen, you Levites, isn't it enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the Israelite community and brought you near to himself to do the work of the Lord's tabernacle and stand before the community and minister to them? He's brought you and all your fellow Levites near himself, but now you're trying to get the priesthood too. It is against the Lord that you and all your followers have banded together. Let's be satisfied. Let's be satisfied where God has put us. Let's remain in the state where we were when first we came to know the Lord. You seek great things for yourself. Seek them not. The remains of indwelling sin showed itself then in their power at Shechem. You have to kill carnal ambition. And these men then, judgment came on them. Because they ached and itched for a name and power. Secondly, Nadab and Abihu, two sons of Aaron, who worship God their own way. We're told in Numbers chapter 3 and verse 4, they made an offering with unauthorized fire before God in the desert of Sinai. They thought their way of worshiping God. Well, you know what? God had specified so clearly and meticulously in the book of Leviticus how he was to be worshipped and that there was holy fire that was maintained there in that Old Testament tabernacle. It wasn't common fire, but they said fire is fire, is fire, is fire. And they didn't realize it was common flames. And holy things then were contaminated, were belittled. And God minded, because God was teaching them in their childhood state there, that they had to do things God's way. That inventiveness and creativity about their views of who God might be had no place when God had spoken and told them what he was like and how he was to be approached by a sacrifice through the priests and Levites. They were to come. And decisive punishment came on them because God says to them, you do it my way. My way, you come to me. And thirdly, the Levites then, Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, the high priest, and they stooped to gross immorality. Remember the three awful things that that they did. The first was concerning the sacrifices that they made to God. And it's very interesting. You want to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verses 12 to 17. And you will see there. What we are told about these Levites. First Samuel 2.12 Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice and while the meat was being boiled the servant of the priest, the Levite would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, 
the servant of the priest, the Levite, would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. You won't accept boiled meat from you, only raw. The man said, well, let the fat be burned up first and then take whatever you want. The servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. And then the second wickedness is what often goes with bullying and with choosing to worship God your own way. It was sexual sin. And it's there in 1 Samuel 2.22. Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And then the third thing they did was to pick up the Ark of the Covenant as though it was a lucky charm and take it out of the Holy of Holies and bring it into battle against the Canaanites. And they were crying, let God then fight for, for himself. And he did, not in the way they expected, but Hophni and Phinehas and their father Eli were all killed. And I'll give you one more, one more example. And we go 2,000 years now to Annas and Caiaphas, chief priests, when the Lord Jesus had come to this world. Their task was to point out to the people that the sacrifices were simply types. They were signs. They were foretastes. They themselves and the blood of bulls and heifers and pigeons and goats couldn't cleanse people from their sin, but they were pointing forward to the Messiah who would come day, one day. That uh, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. They would tell the people what Isaiah had prophesied about the coming of that one. But when he came, they didn't want to know him. They wouldn't receive him. They lied about him, paying false witnesses and condemned him to the death of the cross. They handed Israel's Messiah over to Israel's enemies, the Gentiles, to crucify. The marks of Shechem are hard to eliminate. That cruel murder 2,000 years earlier is overshadowed now by the murder of God the Son. I can't get rid of these marks, says Levi. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, said Paul. You can change your marks. The Pharisee can change the marks of a Pharisee for the marks of being a servant of the living Christ. You remember on the day of Pentecost then, Peter stood before them and he told them that Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God and they with wicked hands had crucified and slain him. Your sons, he said, they've taken whips and beat him and they've taken a sledgehammer and nails and attached him to a cross and they've mocked him there and they've killed him and buried him. You've done that. You servants of the greatest of all high priests, you've killed him. And you've killed him because God has determined through his death to bring the offer of mercy to you. But pardon and forgiveness can tonight be yours through what you did when you slew the loveliest, the Prince of Life. There was an offer of mercy to the scattered sons of Levi. And what happened? Did they take it? Ah, uh, we're told in Luke chapter, Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, a large number of the priests believed. Grace and peace. Levi and his line found it. And when they were scattered by a new persecution, they went through Europe in an even greater scattering 
everywhere preaching Jesus Christ to them. Let me say one final thing about the limited and temporary purpose of their lives. Levites had a purpose under the old covenant, under the old covenant dispensation. It was limited to that time before the Messiah came. They were to lead the people of Israel. They were to instruct them. The people came with their offerings. And if you remember, there's no redemption in the blood that you're offering here of bulls. This is just pointing forward to the Lamb of God who will come. One day he'll come. The seed of the woman will come. He'll bruise that serpent's head. And he will bless not just our nation, but all the nations of the world. That's going to come. They told them. They were servants. And never more than when they pointed people to the one who was to come. There was nothing permanent in their office. Like the kings and the badger cloth and the shittim wood. And the judges and the prophets and the kings of Israel. They all went never, never to be returned. No more holy city, no more holy land. There's a date stamp on it all, not to be used after the Messiah had come. And that's what they told the children of Israel. He'll come, you know. He will. Messiah will come. He'll not be of the line of Levi. It's not uh, of our lineage. We have not that honor given to us. There's going to be another figure, and he came. They told them about him. You know, our, our great father, Abram, met him. His name was Melchizedek. And he came. We know nothing about where he came from. What happened to him. He was without beginning or end of days. We don't know quite what to do with him. But he's there. And our father Abram came. And made a sacrifice. Made a tithe. Offering to him. Bowing to him. Our Lord Jesus. Is of that line a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek's priesthood wasn't temporary. It wasn't marred because in the past Melchizedek had flashed his sword and killed in anger. He falls out of the blue and he disappears without father and without mother and end of days. The priesthood of Levi, just a temporary priesthood, just to tell the people, to prepare the people, but The priesthood of Melchizedek, the priesthood of Jesus Christ is forever. He comes, the priest and the sacrifice. He'll have the allegiance of the people. He'll live at God's right hand. He'll say, as a student, he's troubled. He doesn't know if he's a Christian. There's a girl and she's homesick and she's uncertain about whether she's made the right choice. She doesn't understand the message. Send the spirit of strength, Father. Send the spirit of illumination. Send the spirit who comforts into her heart, into his mind, into his soul tonight. The great high priest praying for you, helping you, ministering to you, not of the line of Levi, that unworthy line but of the order of Melchizedek. What a fulfilled, what an effective, what an accomplished priesthood it is. We look at the tribe of Levi as we have tonight, and it's cobwebby. And we see through a glass darkly, we see some of their functions, and we say, ah, that reminds me of Jesus. It was before them, and it was taught them in order that I might see my Savior in them. And the birth of Levi failed to bind us together and bind us to him. It didn't work. He was bound to his shameful brother Simeon. But one came whose name was Bans. And he's bound us to him with unbreakable cords of love. And so you come to Revelation 7. And you read there of the uh, tribes of Levi... 12,000 of them, we are told, were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And Levi's tribe is written on the gates of heaven. Many of the priests believing its history was checkered. The priests abused their power. But he came, he came tenderly. He 
came to sinners. He came to show his love in saving them. The Lamb of God, who was given as a priest sacrifice, who shed his own blood, who sprinkled the mercy seat of God above, and so has cleansed us, so that we may go through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, and know him. Know him as our God and our Savior. Lord, bless your word again tonight. We thank thee for a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We thank thee for thy tenderness and forgiveness to a man and his line as evil as Levi's. And so this hope for every one of us here tonight. Oh Lord, may we seize the day when the challenge comes, who is on the Lord's side? And we'll say, Savior, it's me. Here am I. Help me to serve thee. Help me to battle with the world and the flesh and the devil all my days. Help me to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, my Savior, because it's in his name we pray. Amen.